just two small boys going fishing. Who are they? What are they like? What kind of men are they most likely to become? Let's see if the town they live in holds the answer to their future. Our two fishermen live in Anamosa, an American small town of about 4,000 people, which is located a little west of the Mississippi River in the state of Iowa. The one long main street is all most people see of Anamosa as they drive along Route 64 between Chicago and Cedar Rapids. But the town is not just a strip of pavement lined with stores, restaurants, and gasoline stations. These are some of the people of the town. These faces are American faces. And yet, their ancestors came from many different countries. A generation passed, or two, or three, and they were the faces of England, Germany, Norway, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Scotland, Wales, and Syria. All are together now at a bend of the Wapsipinicon River in the farm country of the American Midwest. The people of Anamosa, the way they live and the way they think, will influence the way Rusty Minicky and his friend Ronnie Smith will live and think when they grow up. The fish are not biting today, but the boys accept their disappointment. They're fishermen. The road back to town winds and turns through the woods. Main Street and stores and windows for hopeful fishermen. Let them explore the windows while we explore the town. The houses of Anamosa reflect the taste of their individual owners. Not so long ago, all the houses of Anamosa were more or less styled like this. But the appeal of modern architecture is as strong here as it is all over America. The churches of Anamosa are small, but there are many of them, for the people of the town are of many different denominations. The elementary school is new, built in the last three years, while the high school, which is much older, grew addition by addition with the town itself. Shade trees shelter the library. In the summer, books are read on the lawn, and there are story hours for the very young. The hospital, made from native Iowa limestone, is run by the Catholic Sisters of Mercy. But why is Anamosa where it is? What is its reason for being where it is? Why is it the center of local government for miles around? There is only one reason. Farms and farmers. Anamosa is in the middle of a wide area of deep, rich soil. It is surrounded on every side by acres of grain and green meadows filled with sheep and hogs and cattle. Everything that happens in the town, everything the town is, depends on the weather, the dark earth and the sun. But Rusty and Ronnie today are interested not in grain, sheep, or cattle. Today, it is fish. And perhaps the hardware store, which sells everything from a ring for a bull's nose to a television set, will have another fishing lure that will work. It's worth finding out. Another thing you can get in the hardware store, as anywhere else in town, is friendly advice. Where are the fish flies, mister? Right down here, boys. Thank you. 
Everett Mayberry can remember the day when he, too, had time for fishing. Here's what we want. Yeah, those are the ones. Mr. Mayberry, can we catch many fish with these? Yes, those are dandies. I've caught lots of fish for those. Thank you. But today, his job takes most of his time. Mr. Mayberry owns and operates a dairy farm with his wife's help. Mrs. Mayberry drives the tractor that draws the hay baler, while her husband loads the heavy bales of hay. Midwestern farms are large, about 200 acres, and the families that live on them must do nearly all of their own work. The hired hand of yesterday is fast disappearing in Iowa, and modern machines have become a necessity. Everett Mayberry's Guernsey cows produce several hundred gallons of milk a week. With his large herd, a milking machine is a necessity, for milking is a daily, time-consuming task. Mayberry doesn't sell his milk directly to the consumer as farmers did in the old days. He is a member of the Cedar Rapids Cooperative Dairy. Every other day, the cooperative's truck comes to collect his raw milk, which is stored in a refrigerated metal tank. With all the machinery on his farm, Mr. Mayberry must be as good a mechanic as he is a farmer to operate his place efficiently. A receipt for his milk. For Everett Mayberry must keep a fairly complex set of books. The number of gallons a year and the market price of milk determine his economic position. The Mayberries have no sons to help them work the farm as some of their neighbors do. Their three daughters are young and of school age. They can, however, help their mother. The Mayberries have a modern approach to living, as this kitchen with counter service testifies. The Mayberries do not grow all their food as their grandparents did. Under today's conditions, it is easier and cheaper for them to buy much of their food in the local supermarket. The long cases and shelves of the modern market hold foodstuffs from every part of the world. Wheeling a carriage down the aisles makes an adventure out of shopping. Here in America, it has become a family adventure. Over a thousand miles from either ocean, the Mayberries, unlike their grandparents, can buy fruit from Hawaii and fish from Maine. Seasons in foods have been eliminated by today's supermarket. A pretty girl and a machine. Together, they add up the purchases. And the packages are on their way to the farm. Oh, she's fine. Good. Five. Thirty. Thank you very much. Mrs. Margaret Weir is not a farmer's wife, but lives in the town with her husband and two children, and works at the Collins Radio Company, one of Anamosa's new and thriving industries. Radio receivers and other electronic equipment are made here for the BOAC, Swiss Air, Iberia, and many other airlines throughout the world. The workers are all local people. Many of them are farm girls who had no engineering knowledge. But each is trained in a few weeks to do a special job, and to do it with skill. 
Mrs. Weir, a farmer's daughter, was trained for the delicate work of precision instruments. This is a modern trend all over America as the factories move out to the farmland. But it's not all work in Anamosa. The people of the town, despite the radio and television, still provide most of their own means of entertainment. Once a week on Wednesday evenings, the local high school band gives a concert on the post office lawn. The young people are not professional musicians, but band practice and concerts bring them together in a pleasurable pursuit. Most of the town attends these concerts on warm summer evenings, including Dr. John Paul. The young people in the band are, in a way, his young people. He brought most of them into the world. Dr. Paul has been serving the people of Anamosa for 40 years. Most of his patients are his close friends. He knows their troubles and problems as well as their health, and his advice is sought on all three. He is a typical small-town doctor, always on call. Dr. Paul has a young assistant, Dr. John Bailey. One of the many babies Dr. Paul delivered in his time was Dr. Bailey. Dr. Paul is readying the younger man to take over his practice when he himself can no longer care for the people of the town. There was nothing wrong with this patient, but Dr. Paul is a firm believer in a regular schedule of medical checkups and the people of the town accept his ideas. This way, their health is always at his fingertips. Well, thank you, thanks, sir. And how I appreciate father. that. Well, for an 82-year-old gentleman, he's doing fine. Is he 82? That's right. How's the boy on his leg? Good for a youngster with a real boy. How long so has it been? Oh, it's been about a month and a half now. Is it? That's right. All right. Right. I'll, I'll see you later. Doctor. Keep up the interest. All right. right. Leonard Wegman is a banker. With his father and brother, he runs the one bank in town in a building directly across the street from the doctor's office. There's an unusual demonstration taking place in front of the bank today. The Wegmans have reason to be interested in it. This is a fire and rescue truck which the people of Anamosa decided their fire department needed. In time of emergency, its respirator and other equipment can be instantly on the scene to save lives. To avoid increasing the town's budget, the truck and its equipment is being paid for by private contributions. The fire chief and the mayor are active in raising funds. So is Leonard Wegman's father, who with Leonard and his brother are among the heaviest contributors. The truck stands on a main street where people can see it and examine the equipment they are about to purchase. Man with cowboy hat, cigar and Hawaiian shirt a colorful dresser among the more sedate townspeople. The clothes are sort of a billboard for Eli Shada's occupation, meant to draw farmers to the Anamosa cattle auction barn. On Saturday afternoons, the farmers bring their animals for sale. The auctioneer sings a strange chant, but it makes sound sense to those who face him. This farmer and his boys have a particular interest in what is going on. They own the cattle being sold right now. There's a bid, and there's another. Forty-fifty bid, fifty. Forty dollar forty 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 bid,
60, 40, 50 bit, 60, time's up, let's go, 40, 50 bit, 60, everybody, 40, 50 bit, 60, 50 bit, out of the gate, 20, 50 bit, out of the gate, 20, 60, 60, 60, so the count is 20 dollars. Harold Larson's season of hard work has been well rewarded. Harold Larson is proud of his farm and proud of his two sons who help him run it. They will inherit it someday. Harold Larson raises beef cattle mainly. White-faced Herefords, a healthy, rugged breed that make good steaks and roasts. He also raises hogs. It only takes five months for the little ones to grow into big ones. 200 pounds of good pork. Harold Larson's main crop is the corn he feeds his stock. It grows well in the soil around Anamosa. Corn feeding is the secret of fat cattle and prime beef. The man in the approaching car is important in any farm community. When he appears, the farmers stop work and listen. His name is Joe Legg, and his title is county agent. He works partly for the federal government and partly for the state. Joe Legg holds a university degree in agriculture and his job is to advise farmers on the latest discoveries of the agricultural research bureaus and their experimental farms. He has a wide territory to cover, so his hours are long. This farmer is worried about the damage the corn borer is doing to his most important crop and is spraying his field with insecticide. Joe Legg will be able to help him because he is informed of the newest methods of controlling the corn borer. These two are close friends. Carl Folkers is a second generation American farmer born on the farm he works. His family came to Anamosa not so long ago from Germany. They bought good land and took good care of it. So does he. Like Harold Larson, he raises corn to feed his beef steers and hogs. Extensive damage by the corn borer would reduce his yield considerably. And the pest has already entered his acreage. Joe Legg's advice will help him stop the damage. But helping farmers is only part of Joe Legg's job. He also works with farm children. Many farm organizations encourage farm children to raise and care for cattle that belong to them personally. These they exhibit at country fairs, where they are judged in competition and then sold. Joe Legg advises them on the most modern methods of bringing the animals into top condition. This calf belongs to Carl Folker's 16-year-old daughter, Carla. Joe Legg doesn't think it's going to be a prize winner, but it will bring a good price at the fair. Carla's younger brother, Herman, does have a prize winner, and he knows it. Joe Legg is a part of the 4-H Club, a volunteer organization for farmers' children, which is helping to train Herman and Carla for life on the American farm of the future. Like most farm girls, Carla does her own sewing. Not all of it, of course, but when she wants a new dress for school or a new set of drapes for her room, she's quite likely to make it herself. There is a right and wrong side to the cloth. Her mother can tell her which is which. Sewing by hand is too slow for young Carla. For some time now, she has wanted to have her own sewing machine. Her mother agrees that if Carla wants to buy one, she can do so with her own savings. But it's up to Carla. She must decide for herself. 
Mrs. Fokers only hopes that Carla is not being too impulsive. The best way to find a second-hand sewing machine is to place an ad for it in the local newspaper. In a small town, a newspaper publisher like Tom Powell is not just an executive. His job includes reporting, editing, selling, sometimes even delivering the papers. And, of course, telling young customers how to write advertisements for second-hand sewing machines. The newspaper plant has fairly modern equipment and employs five men. Anamosa is not, by any means, large enough to support a daily newspaper. Instead, Tom Powell publishes two weekly papers which appear on Tuesdays and Fridays. The editor's desk is in his outer office open to everyone who wants to talk to him. If you want to visit the editor's wife, you would find her in her kitchen, just six blocks from the office. This evening, Jerry Powell is cooking the most popular of American meals, fried chicken and corn on the cob. Like most American girls, the Powell's daughter, Linda, has her own job to do in the kitchen. There are two other children in the Powell household, Tom Jr. and Sandra. When they all sit down to the table, they present a warm, closely knit family group, served by none but each other. American families are much together. And on Sundays, they worship together. The church also serves as a meeting place for friends and neighbors otherwise busy during the week. Mrs. May Amelia Rumpel, an Anamosa shopkeeper, is very much interested in painting. Just outside of Anamosa, in a tiny community called Stone City, the local art association in which she is active holds weekly meetings and exhibitions. None of the artists is a professional. All are local farmers, merchants, or their wives who paint simply because they enjoy it.
Here, too, the world outside has entered Anamosa, the modern style and the academic, side by side, even in the world of amateur painters. Stone City is the locale of the amateurs of Anamosa. Grant Wood, one of America's better known professionals, once lived and worked here. His best known work, American Gothic, was painted nearby. Outdoor exhibits are all a part of life in Anamosa, as are many other quiet gatherings where people can meet and converse. But so are parades. On one day of the year, the 4th of July, a parade takes on a deeper significance. Today, Anamosa, as does every other town in America, celebrates the 181st year of independence. Everyone takes part. The Girl Scouts, the Cub Scouts, the 4-H girls, the Mounted Horsemen. The 4th of July is not just a holiday to the people of Anamosa. The parade is an expression of gratitude for the past and of hope for the future. On 4th of July, small boys are allowed to stay up late at night, for then there are fireworks all across America, glowing, bursting in the sky. The 4th of July is truly the beginning of summer for Rusty Minicky and Ronnie Smith. Long, lazy, heat-laden days with no school and no cares. Boys with fishing poles are boys the world over. And in Anamosa, too. <laughs> 